Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 10. I'm your host, Eric Moore, and today we're going to be talking about some of the economic indicators that matter for investors, matter for the markets, and also matter to try and decide or figure out what exactly is the Federal Reserve going to do? Are they going to raise or lower rates? And so, you know, every once in a while, I'm, I'm involved in conversations with uh, with people, and they they hear the numbers on the news, and they hear unemployment and inflation and GDP and Fed funds rate, and you know, they they kind of take those numbers, but they they're a little bit unsure of really what goes into them. And and so today on this episode, what we're going to do is just try and take a a little dig deeper into some of these numbers when they come out and why they're important. And the first one we'll really talk about, so we're going to do inflation, unemployment, GDP, and a little bit on on the Federal Reserve and the Fed funds rate. So inflation is one of those things. I mean, it's really our prices going up or down. And so if prices are going up, we have inflation. If they're going down, we have deflation. And this number is released once a month. And typically, you're going to hear either inflation, or you might hear something like core inflation. Now, inflation uh, it's just going to measure a, a basket of, of goods. And they do that through something called the Consumer Price Index. And if you think about a, you, know, you go into the grocery store and you fill up a, a shopping basket with a bunch of stuff, basically what the Consumer Price Index is trying to do is looking at that stuff that's in the basket. And you know you might have a little bit of butter, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of milk, and more of some things, less of others. So that basket is sort of weighted by, you know, the, the things that you use. Uh, but you're going to, they track that over time. They track it over time. And so let's say you went into the, the supermarket 10 years ago and you bought a bunch of stuff and you put it in the basket. And then today, what's the price back then? What's the price today? I mean, that, that's an oversimplified version. But CPI or Consumer Price Index, um, really, as I said, it's a basket of goods, but it's weighted. And there's been a few different changes. They they do some things on it. Up until the 1980s, it really was just a cost of living index. In other words, the things in the basket were fixed. And so to maintain a certain cost of living, you had to sort of track what that would cost over time. And there were really no, um, you know, without getting too much into detail, there really weren't many changes. It was a fixed basket of things. And so uh, it was more of a cost of living index, um, so you can see what to maintain your the same cost of living in one year versus another, how much more that you would need. And then in the 1980s, they came up with something called hedonic adjustments. Now, I'm not going to go into hedonic adjustments and bore you with with those things, but essentially what they did was they said, and "Let's use let's use the new iPhone, right?" So let's say the new iPhone comes out. And it costs twelve hundred dollars, and the iPhone a year ago, the old version was a thousand dollars. And you might say, "Well, that, that's a twenty percent increase in price." And you're right. However, one of the things that they do is they make this hedonic adjustment, and so they're looking at that and they're saying, "Well, we need to sort of, although the price went up, what if all the features and the benefits and there's added things in this new model?" There's some value to that. So they have a, a long formula or way of, of sort of pricing in that value. And so maybe for the index, it's not $120, it's less. And so they do things like hedonic adjustments. Although um, I haven't found, maybe somebody out there knows it or, or I can do a little more research. Um, I'm just thinking about the price of uh, uh, an airline ticket. Uh, I don't think flying has gotten any better. Seats are smaller, still share on the armrest. And... So I don't know if they actually uh, hedonically adjust the the price of airline tickets down because I don't know about you, but it's not getting any better. So anyway, but that's that's one of the things that happens. And then in the '90s, what they did was uh, instead of that fixed basket. So you know, in the, in the '80s, you started to see these hedonic adjustments, and then in the '90s, they changed how CPI was was really. Uh, calculated. And what they did was do substitutions. And so I think the classic example is, well, if you're buying steak and the price of steak goes through the roof, why don't you substitute for chicken? And then steak is either taken out of the basket or its weighting is dramatically dropped. And so the idea of substitutions, and that seems 
you know, kind of natural as long as it's things that you can actually substitute. So uh, if you if you have one good and the price goes higher, you substitute it for something else. There assumes there is a good substitute. But that's a little bit about uh, how the index has changed somewhat over the years. And really, the two things that you see is either the inflation number, and that inflation number includes sort of everything. It includes food and energy. Uh, the core inflation rate actually excludes food and energy because those tend to be more volatile or so. That's the, uh, that's the explanation. Um, there's also something called trimmed mean PCE, and the PCE stands for personal consumption expenditures. And I believe that was created by the Dallas Fed. And what that does, it sort of looks at the things that have gone up the most, the things that have gone down the most, and it trims uh, the biggest changes or the, the items that had the biggest changes, they trim those. So it's more of a, a sort of a median uh, price index. And CPI is is sort of really important because uh, the inflation rate, that matters. And it matters, not only does it sort of drive interest rates, but it also can drive uh, really what your real return is. And remember, uh, you're going to hear things like real versus nominal return. A real return, so a nominal return is just, let's say you got 5% interest on a bond, uh, that's your return for the year. So if you put $10,000 into a, a bond and you got 5%, at the end of the year, you have an extra $500. Great. But let's say you got 5% on a bond, but inflation was 2.5%. Well, your real return is actually your return minus the inflation rate. And so uh, your real return in that example would be 2.5%. Now, let's say inflation was 6% and your return was 5%. Well, that would actually be a negative 1% real return. And in fact, one of the interesting things is if you look at the inflation rate and you look at the Fed funds rate, we've had negative real rates in the U.S. Uh, over the course of, you know, starting in, in, as they started dropping interest rates in 2008 and then for a number of years. So we may touch on that later. But so interest um, really is, or, or, I'm sorry, the, the inflation rate is really important. And one of the other reasons why it's important is it also sort of drives how much interest, or, or I'm sorry, how much of an increase you see in the, uh, the cost of living adjustment or COLA for Social Security. And so people who are on Social Security at the end of the year, uh, the, the payments could get an adjustment up if there's been inflation. And it's kind of interesting. They actually use the CPI uh, for urban wage earners and clerical workers. And you might say, well, retirees aren't exactly urban wage earners and clerical workers. And there's always been some consternation or, or debate about why they use that one. Uh, but it, it's uh, what... The way they do it, they actually don't look at the whole year. They look at the third quarter. So the third quarter is going to be July, August, September. And so, for example, July, August, and September, they average the uh, the CPI for those months in 2017. And let's say in 2018, they look at July, August, September, and they compare Q3 in 18 versus Q3 in 17. And if there's an increase, and I believe this year it's about plus 2.8%, then retirees on Social Security will actually get an increase in, in the payments by that. Uh, but it's only third quarter. They don't look at it. It's third quarter from one year to third quarter of the next year for the Social Security. So, But inflation certainly is, uh, is really important. We saw really high inflation in, in the 70s and then early 80s. In fact, uh, I mean, really, really big inflation. That's when the misery index was started which was the inflation rate plus the unemployment rate. Uh, but large inflation reduces purchasing power. Uh, it also ta- causes real returns to, to go lower and any, any number of other things. But when you hear inflation, uh, that's really what you're looking at. You know, the other one that, that people talk about is unemployment. And so the unemployment, you can kind of see that as unemployment drops, in theory, more people are working and uh, hopefully wages are going up, and that would indicate a, a strong economy. The, the the lower the unemployment number is, in theory, right, there's more competition for workers, and hopefully 
uh, that competition causes the market to shift in, in workers' favor. But unemployment is it's a measure of uh, – it looks at – okay. So the way they do unemployment is it's people looking for work but are unemployed uh, divided by the, the people working plus those same people who are looking for work. And so if you're, let's say, retired and you don't want a job, uh, you just want to be retired or you've sort of given up and you don't want to, you're not looking for work. You have to be looking for work to be counted in this or working. And so that's the way they do it. And by the way, I think uh, somebody had asked me recently, there was uh, um, some political candidate who suggested that if you work two jobs or people work two jobs, uh, therefore unemployment is low right now. Um, it's You don't get counted twice if you work two jobs. So it's simply the, the people looking for work um, and then the people working plus those people looking for work, and then you get the percentage. And so not everyone looks for work um, and not everybody is actually participating in the workforce. And so a little bit more about these numbers. Uh, there are, I believe that what happens is they, you know, they do a survey and they ask people over the last four weeks, have they looked for work? And then there's also what they consider marginally attached and marginally attached, uh, they were available for work and they wanted work and they may have looked for a job sometime in the last year or 12 months. Uh, but they're, they're not counted as unemployed because they didn't look in the last four weeks. And this is done by a survey, by the way. So people are surveyed. And then there, there are people who are considered discouraged workers. They're not looking for work um, because they believe no jobs are available. So the way that this works is, you know, if you're not looking, you're not counted in the numbers. Hopefully that, that makes sense. So which brings up the, the question, well, if not all, everybody is counted in the unemployment number, so what does that mean? Like how many people are just not looking for work or don't want work? And that's where we can look for something called the labor participation rate. And the labor participation rate tells you of the population uh, what percentage are included in, in the labor force. And so civilian labor force participation rate in October of 2018 was about 62.7%. Uh, that's down from, let's say, 2008. Uh, but right now, about 62.7% um, is a labor participation rate. You know, the other metric, and I believe former Fed Chair Janet Yellen used to talk about this in her press conferences, I believe she said she watched it, is this data point. It's called the quit rate. And the quit rate is people who are quitting their jobs. And so naturally, a quit rate is, in Janet Yellen's, the way she would describe it, is a good indicator of people's confidence, not only the confidence in, in the job market, uh, but people willing to quit and then maybe go and, and get a new job. And so when that goes higher, that can be showing a little more strength in the economy. And so I'll give you a, a number on that. In 2009, the quit rate was about 1.3%. August of 2018, it jumped up to 2.4%. And so um, that's the quit rate. And then, of course, this whole bit of you know, do you have a job? And then what's your wage growth? And so um, unfortunately, since 2008, prior to 2008, wage growth, uh, right before then, I guess this would have been about the, the third quarter, was roughly 3.5%. Um, so actually, I'm sorry, 4.25% was the wage growth in, in 2007, my mistake. And then more recently, it's it's been about 3.5%. And so wage growth is still lower in the U.S. from where it was prior to the you know the Great Recession, and the wage growth that the Atlanta Fed uses it's a three month moving average of median wage growth. So when you think about employment, it's the employment number, labor participation rate. You can look at wage growth, and you can also look at you know maybe I would say the quit rate's more of a fringe one, but certainly former Fed chair. Uh, Janet Yellen thought enough of it to actually mention it in her press conferences. But these are all things. Now, remember, right now for the markets, uh, there's a lot of views. Uh, there's a lot of um, you know interest in interest rates and what the Fed will do. And so sometimes 
people are trying to figure out, you know, if the if the economy is getting really good, um, does that mean that they're more apt to raise interest rates because they want to cool it off? And so all of these things are are important. The other one that people are really watching is GDP or gross domestic product. And so GDP is probably, you know, the most widely used. You hear politicians talking about it, people on TV, and you, you'll hear gross domestic product as a way to measure the overall economy. In fact, you're looking at it to measure the growth of an economy. And so gross domestic product, or GDP, it's, it's uh, really measuring all of the, the, the final value of finished goods in the United States. Okay, what the heck does that mean? Well, it, it's you know things that are made in other countries, that would be part of their GDP. Uh, but it's looking for things that domestically in the United States are finished goods and the value of those finished goods. And the idea is as GDP is growing, the economy is growing. And so GDP, unlike unemployment, which comes out monthly and usually right around the middle of the month, and also inflation, same time, right around the middle of the month, uh, GDP actually works a little bit different. You don't necessarily get a a monthly GDP number. What you do is you get a quarterly, and here's the way it works. So let's look at uh, Q3, which is July, August, and September. What happens is the month of September closes. October, you get what's called an advanced estimate of Q3 GDP. And so that's the month right after the end of the quarter. And then in November, so a month later, you get the second estimate. And that's a revised Q3 GDP number. And then not until December do you actually get the final final GDP percent number. And so, you know, the quarter ends... And then, you know, in September, in, in our example here, and then it's not till December that you actually see the number. And so you won't know, let's say the quarter ending in December, you won't know what the final 2018 uh, GDP percent increase or decrease. At this point, it's tracking for, uh, for an increase. You won't know what that final full year is until March of 2019. And so it takes a little bit of time to come in. But I said the the GDP, it measures finished goods or final goods. It doesn't measure intermediate goods. And so I'll get a little bit wonky here into the weeds for you. Uh, let's look at something like a baseball hat. So a baseball hat typically has wool. It has cotton in it. Uh, it may have a little plastic, you know, in the brim. Sometimes they put plastic in there. And so if you think about it, well, there's the value of the plastic, the value of the wool, the value of the cotton, and then the hat. Let's say the hat sells for 25 bucks and the the plastic was two bucks, the wool was a buck, and the, the cotton was a dollar. Well, here's the thing. All you're doing is you're looking at the final hat, that product. You don't count the plastic, the wool, or the cotton, because if you did that, you would be double counting. And so all of those are called intermediate goods, and those are all contained in the final good, the hat. And so there's gross output, or GO, uh, which is now available. Uh, that actually measures some of the different stages of production or intermediate goods. But GDP just looks at what consumers uh, are buying, what businesses via you know business investment is buying, what government is doing, and then it nets out exports minus uh, imports, and that gets you your your final GDP number. By the way, we're typically a net importing country, uh, meaning we run a, a trade deficit, not a, a surplus. Uh, and by the way, that's not always bad because if there's another country that can make something cheaper and more efficiently and better, and and we can enjoy those lower prices. Uh, that's that's normally good, uh, but th- you know that's m- maybe at some point later we can get into that. But I'll leave it there for now. Uh, but just like we had before, there's also real versus nominal GDP, and so your nominal GDP is just the the, the value, but real GDP, what that does is it adjusts it for inflation. And so one of the big things here is if, let's say, prices go up but nothing new is created, well, all that happened was the prices went up. It didn't mean that the economy grew or um, there was all this new amount of goods in in the economy. And so to kind of use our silly hat example, if a hat is 25 bucks and you have a 20% increase in inflation, and by the way, a hat's the only thing that we did in the economy. We made one hat. One hat was all we did. 
so it went from 25 bucks, the final good of the hat, to $30, and we still had that same one hat. Well, that's a 20% increase. There's 20% inflation. So the, the nominal GDP uh, would be $30, but the real GDP would get revised down or adjusted down for inflation back down to 25 and we would actually have 0% uh, change year over year. And so there's that inflation thing again. And inflation, they have something called a GDP deflator. And that's just how the, the headline of the nominal GDP is, is brought down. Now, all of this, as I said, uh, people are looking and they're tracking and they're trying to figure out, what is that Federal Reserve going to do? And so one of the things that the Fed does is it sets what's called the Fed funds rate. And that's the rate uh, the percentage rate that banks charge one another for overnight lending. You know, banks are required to keep a certain amount of money on deposit and they can lend out the rest. And so if their reserve levels get, um, you know, too too low, they can borrow from another bank or uh, they can actually go to the Fed itself. But the Fed funds rate is sort of one of those uh, baseline rates. Um, after really a decade of near zero over the last uh, two years or so, we've, we've seen them raise rates. And they'll have meetings, uh, you know, every, usually just about every month. Some of them are press conferences, some of them aren't. But the Federal Reserve is using all of this data that's coming in with the economy, and they're trying to figure out, uh, do they want to raise rates or not? And typically, the Fed would raise rates to sort of cool off inflation. Uh, So if, if prices were getting too hot, they wouldn't want to make money tighter so they could raise rates. Uh, they could sell assets. So right now, another thing people are watching is the, the level of assets on the Fed balance sheet. One of the things they've indicated, instead of keeping the balance sheet, and by the way, by balance sheet, what they did was they bought things like mortgage-backed securities, they bought uh, you know, government, treasury bonds, and so it was, over, it was over $4 trillion. They've indicated as those bonds mature, they're going to let them run off the balance sheet. They're not going to reinvest it. Um, They can increase reserve requirements at banks. So they do a lot of things to try and make money easier or harder uh, to get to. And that's one of the ways that they try and uh, keep inflation. One of their targets is, you know, they have an employment mandate and they've got an inflation mandate. Uh, Whether that should or shouldn't be everything or The only thing they do, or should they do more or less, that's another discussion. But um, obviously, all of this economic data is important because it really drives and sort of shapes some of the decisions that the the Federal Reserve Board of Governors will make. And so today, uh, you know, look, I just wanted to, every once in a while, somebody says, you know, I hear these numbers and I always, you know, I'm watching the news and they talk about GDP and uh, could you just sort of simplify it for me and uh, and just go through a couple reasons or, or sort of ways that these numbers are created and what they measure and, you know, how important are they. So these are some of the ones, uh, you know, it's not the only important ones. There are others, uh, but these are certainly some of the big ones that, that people are watching. So hopefully that uh, cleared up a couple of things for you. Remember, folks, if, if you find value in this, please share a link to the podcast, share it with some of your friends, and even if they're not your friends, share it with them as well. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, see everyone.